Um, I'm recently married. I got married in the pandemic in our backyard in October to Mary Rose Go. I'm madly in love with. <clears throat> and um, I wrote this poem. I this is from Brooklyn Antediluvian. Brooklyn Antediluvian. I wrote. I wrote um, after a breakup. So there's a sort of this flood of feeling that is in that book, and a flood of healing, I guess, too. So I, I just want to thank Glenn and all the folks at Cornell and all you all, and I wish you all the best with your with your writing this term. Um, my last poem, Ode to Eating a Pomegranate in Brooklyn. When I fall in love again, I will have another heart and a second set of eyes, which is one way to watch the woman you love grow old. The story of my heartbreak started like this. Someone gave me a key that opens many doors. I traded it for a key that opens only one. I trade, traded that one for another and that for another until there were no more doors and I had a fist full of keys. At any given moment, only part of the world is gruesome. There are three pomegranates in the fridge waiting to be broken open. When I fall in love again, my beloved and I will spit seeds into the street until the birds come to pluck them. When I fall in love, I'll count the tick of little pits in city puddles. I'll forget the dead and count the doors instead. Thank you very, very much. Actually, like just, we talk about syntax often in poetry, but I mm -hmm. think like people actually don't know what they're talking about, right? Like it's just how do you turn how do you turn a phrase um, you know inside out, right? Like what you know what part uh, is modifying what, right? Like is it you know adverbial or adjectival? Um, you know like we're syncing or linking, you know um, participial phrases. Um, you know, parentheticals, a positives, right? Like, like you have to kind of understand there's the poetics, right? In terms of like metaphor and music, but then there's also just like the beauty of the sentence, right? Like, what does it mean to kind of write a really interesting sentence? So when I'm revising, I'm not thinking about this on the front end, but when mm -hmm. I go back, I'm like, okay, well, like what kind of sentence is this? Like what am I saying and what am I saying it? And then how am I, like all modification is compli complication, right? Like usually we have one simple thing that we wanna say and then we're adding uh, layers, right? Mm. So um, David Orr uh, had a, a, a great, um, or Gregory Orr, excuse me, mm -hmm. um, kind of said that there are like two ways to think about editing. Um, we can think of it as a sculptor where we have like a huge block of marble and we're kind of whittling it down to a figure, right? Um, you know, so it's, Mike, you know, Michelangelo, you, like you see the object through the stone, right? So you have like a big messy thing and you're polishing it to kind of make it beautiful, right? So that's one mode. The other mode is, um, you know, that you have a skeletal structure and you're uh, adding layers, right? Like the modeling structure where you have a, you know, if, if you draw, you know this, like you begin with a kind of like a stick structure and then you add complication, right? To create body, um, you know, from- this disease and also saying, I think it's deeply troubling the notion that we have to suffer to be an artist. Um, especially right this minute, please, like, I'm sorry, I'm already struggling. <laughs> like, I'm not going to suffer even more to be your artist, like, jump off a pier. I don't care to do that. Um, this is an idea that um, I actually first heard from Hanif Abdurraqib, who's an amazing essayist and poet, and he was talking about how when writing his, maybe two books ago, just felt like a real 
struggle and that he just suffered a lot while writing it. And he was like, I'm kind of done suffering for writing. And I was like, what is that idea? That's, that was just really helpful for me because I, I feel like my first book, Fear Icons, took me a decade and there was a lot of suffering involved in it. And I was like, yeah, what is it like to not suffer as much through the writing or to force it? And it's always going to be hard. I think writing for me is always hard, but that doesn't mean I have to dedicate myself to the pain and I don't owe anyone that pain. And so one thing that I've talked about with my students is setting up boundaries and understanding what the limits are of what you want to write about. So let's say you're writing about um, your history with your mom and it's a very complex history. You get to choose what you include and what you exclude and to include the things you're ready for that when you're done writing about them, they might make you feel sad. They might make you feel lots of things, but they don't make you feel small or depleted. That instead you feel like you have found words for something that you wanted to find words for, but that you don't owe anyone the deepest, most painful parts in order to sell a book or to have it read. That's not necessary or it shouldn't be. And that's also cultural, right? That the writers, both a genius and one who suffers for their art, none of those things are true. In my mind, the writer is someone who just is persistent and makes choices and hopefully learns to make choices that are sustaining as a creative being, because otherwise I don't know how to keep going. You, you benefit if you do. I think that we're more and more hybrid readers. I think younger writers and readers uh, are used to looking at things on the screen and tablet. I think we're used to the graphic novel, I think, I think actually on the other side, the show, the, the, the you know, all the stuff, I don't even call it TV anymore, but all the stuff we're watching now that are miniseries or short movies, they're getting more and more literary and text-based too. They, they, the cartoon is going to kind of, I think that we're, we're, I think the audience for this is growing. Um, I think the problem is the publishing world is a couple steps behind. And I think that the truth is small presses get it more than you know um big presses but small presses often don't have the money or the backing to do it it's often a matter of you know costs mm -hmm. and so i think the the collaborative spirit is the one very fluid i wrote every single day i had just the concept and that was all it took yeah oh. <laughs> I wish I had that. Yeah, <laughs> that is cool. Yeah, for me, with, with this book specifically, like it's usually like disgruntled things. Like I've been often upset that like uh, like black language can't be analytical or academic black speech, and um, and then this other thing here, me loving rap. So it happens to like come together in this for me. It was like, oh, this is a field where I can be like analytical with my own speech and be free with it. Um, and because also like rap comes out of this community and I don't, I don't want to like put a damn sweater vest on my rap book, you know, like I don't want to pull up his pants and so to speak. So I was like, I want to write it in a way that's close to where it is and close to my community. And then from that, like spins other places, like, oh, I need to invite other people in this book that I've talked about rap with before. You know, so it's reaching out to my friends from kindergarten who we've like talked about Nas with in seventh grade and like have them come in. So for me, it starts with like something I love and then some, something I'm disgruntled with, like coming together and then an image and then it spins out from there. Interesting, yeah. Traditional plot just seems ridiculous at times to me. I'm just like, does it work anymore? And I was thinking that, you know, years ago, like that, you know, uh, and, and poets have been, you know, thinking about, and I say plot, which I know it doesn't apply to poetry, but that those different kinds of tensions and like, this be you doing like where you're, you're taking things and putting them next to each other and suddenly something happens and you get plot that way. Like that you wouldn't, then when I'm pushing straight forward on the line, I can't get that. But when I put two things together and associate, do the free association, suddenly there's magic that happens there. And like, that's, I think, a really beautiful way of making things. And it also requires an incredible amount of trust. And so uh, who knows? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I think there are so many ways to do it. I mean, I talk, 
for, for a long time, and I, I say this so much that I it feels rote almost, but I, I when asked about plot, I always go back to Lori Moore's short story, How to Become a Writer, in which people accuse the narrator of having a ludicrous notion of plot. Everyone in her writing workshop hates everything she's ever written. And, and, <laughs> and, uh, and she at some point says, plots are for dead people. And I said, <laughs> like, that, that was sort of my road answer for a long time. Plots are for dead people. And, uh, and, and yet <laughs> one, you know, I do talk a lot about narrative drive or how you, how you keep a reader there, how you keep a reader going, which I think is maybe about as close as I get to understanding plot, even because the traditional notions of it have never really worked for me either or or just never resonated and I I've come to being I think my wonder comes from when I read stories that come together as a whole not because they had a plot hook that took me to the end and left me feeling mm -hmm. satisfied yet questioning and you know or whatever it is but that kind of you come to the end resist. And so finding a different opening became important, which meant I did have to start to move things around. Um, and I did do that actually in the same way that Thisby's talking about of cutting pa actual physical pages and then moving things around to find which juxtapositions were really speaking to each other. Um, part of the work of this book was pretty particular in that I was doing lots of work through compression of compressing images, each line sounding like a line of poetry. Those were things I really wanted to have as sort of imagistic prose, since it is so driven by the image of the icon as its foundational force. Um, and so that work was very important that each line had a lot of um, concision to it and a lot of imagery. Um, but to speak to a larger question, something that really helps me structurally when I'm thinking about essays, particularly when they have lots of different layers, is to draw the map of the essay, um, to have some kind of image associated with the essay. Um, John McPhee writes about this in a really great essay on structure where he shows how he draws images, spirals, and all sorts of different ways of visually interpreting the structure of the essay. Um, and that's something I really rely on when I'm writing essays, so. Thanks. I love to hear you talk about that, Keisha. Um, I, my formal training was in fiction and poetry. And so I really felt like I was kind of going in blind, you know, as you do as a kid, right? Like, uh, or at least I would do. I, I thought I was going to go blind when I was older, so I was preparing. Um, uh, and I think um, I mean, here are some recent postcards. But this is Wendy. This is Holly. I think that I think that moving things around. I didn't. I wasn't thinking of it. It's really helpful what you said about. I have been thinking about juxtaposition recently, but, um, and I think <laughs> it, it, the process of revising this book, although many of the essays had been published, previously published, um, was still so much work. You know, my, um, my dad's going through chemo right now and he was sort of, you know, he was like, isn't the book done already? I mean, this was, you know, <laughs> last year and just, I, I also, I, I printed out, and when I was working on the essays that I had the most trouble with, printed them out and spread them across the room and was moving things around and cutting things up. It was, it was very hard to see the structure. And that's where I think postcards, something small, and then um, moving, uh, dancing in series started to help me see where the repetitions and echoes were because I couldn't see it before. I can't write a, I've never been able to write a, uh, what is it, an outline and then write a paper. 
I wish. Yeah, I feel the same. I mean, I write in that way. Yes, absolutely. I, I that that sort of reminds me like. I know that we're kind of in the business of giving advice, and I'm trying to refrain from doing that. But so maybe I can I can formulate this in another way, Heather. But um, I think one of the things in this journey of like not coming from a traditional from a traditional route, one thing that I have kept in my mind in one form or another is protect your strangeness and cultivate cultivate your dream life um because um i i don't i don't mean this in a in in a paranoid sense but it's always under attack the fact of its strangeness puts it in exile and various sort of intellectual and cultural forces want to keep it in exile but what the imagination wants to do is say come mm -hmm. You, you have singing to do. And so I think it's really important. And, it, and that's one of the things that actually defines our solitude, the 15 or 20 people who are in, in, the, in this Zoom right now. It's what distinguishes us from one another is the particularity of our imaginations, our strangeness from one another. But the irony is is that particularity and that strangeness is also what brings us together because there's this kernel of mysteriousness to ourselves that we as artists are trying to approach every day, every time we go to the page. I wanna to get to that thing, that thing that is my life force, that is my love that was handed down to me and, to, and which I will, I will I'll also hand over and that's that's the most gratifying part because when, I think that when you get close to it, that's when the work begins to resonate. The craft is sort of, it's great to learn that stuff and it's important to learn that stuff. But to me, that, that journey, that attempt, that approach to that mysteriousness, that strangeness, that's what we call soul. Mm 